everyone. Welcome to Cellular Healing TV. I'm Ashley Smith. Today we welcome Beth Zupak-Kania, who is the head nutrition consultant for the Charlie Foundation for Ketogenic Therapies, a special nonprofit that provides information about diet therapies for people with epilepsy, other neurological disorders, and select cancers. She's joining Dr. Pompa today to talk about the relationship between fasting and ketogenic diet therapy, the benefits of both, and they'll also discuss some cautions and advise you on where to start if ketogenic therapy appeals to you. Just a bit more about our guest, Beth. Beth Zupak Kania is a registered dietitian and nutritionist who has promoted safe and effective ketogenic therapy since 1991. She's managed ketogenic diets in individuals with autism, epilepsy, mitochondrial and metabolic disorders, migraines, MS, rare genetic disorders, various cancers, and Parkinson's disease. She's authored over 50 publications, co-authored the Modified Keto Cookbook, co-organized three global ketogenic symposiums, and is the designer of the web-based Keto Diet Calculator. Beth has provided diet training to over 250 medical centers world, worldwide, owns Ketogenic Therapies LLC, and is, of course, a consultant to the Charlie Foundation. This is going to be a great episode. But before we get started, this is for you practitioners out there. Dr. Pampa's Live It to Lead It seminar is coming up from November 2nd to the 4th in Las Vegas. We'd love to have you join us. And at the end of this episode, stay tuned for a special code for you to take $200 off your ticket price. So let's get started and welcome Dr. Pampa and his guest, Beth Zupakania, to the show. This is Cellular Healing TV. Welcome to Cell TV. We're glad you're here. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I just said before we got on, you know, I, I had a, a, a big explanation with one of my clients about why ketosis for Alzheimer's. And I get it with a lot. Well, why, why this diet for autoimmune? Why this diet for autism? Why this diet? And it could, goes down the list. So, and then I, we get a lot of questions, like people struggling or, you know, whatever about ketosis. And my team found what you do. And I'll tell you, you've been at this longer than uh, most people. Now, I'm not going to age you here, okay? <laughs> but you've been at it a long time. So I want your wisdom. And I think my viewers and listeners want your wisdom. So um, anyways, I, I have to ask this first. How did you get into this I'm such a long time ago? So tell them the story. Yeah, and my age will probably come out because I'm going to talk about myself maybe a little bit. I don't like normally doing that, but because there's a, a relative story, I, I will reveal later on if we have time. But I got involved in um, ketogenic therapy 27 years ago when the neurologist at the Children's Hospital where I worked at at the time came to my office was looking for somebody. He was recruiting somebody to work with a ketogenic diet and he walked in, I have to be sitting there and he said, I need somebody to do the ketogenic diet. And I said, the what? <laughs> you know, I didn't know anything about it. And then I went back and I chatted with my colleagues and I did remember, oh man, we did learn something about this in school, but I had no clue. I thought it was a low fat diet. So um, that was the early genesis of it. it. It turned out the reason he was asking, we, because a man named Jim Abrams had gone on Dateline and had exposed that his son, who had very difficult to control epilepsy, was started on a ketogenic diet at Johns Hopkins and his seizures stopped within days. So what movie was that featured in? So Jim wrote a movie called First Do No Harm. Yes, I love that movie. Yes, and it's, it's not a story about his son. It's a story about a, another family who had written to Jim, and, and a lot of families after he was on Dateline wrote and said, my kid went through this. You know, we're so thankful that we found the ketogenic diet. This is how we found out. But this story that he wrote, First Do No Harm, was very compelling because there was so much drama in it, and it was a true oh. story. And I've met the young man that was depicted in the story, the, the little boy that had bad, bad epilepsy, oh. ended up in a hospital in Chicago. And um, they do the scene in the movie where, you know, the doctors are really just, um, you know, they're ready to pound him with some heavy drugs to get him uh -huh. into a coma. And the nurse just was sympathetic to the family. And, and, the, and the family was like, enough, we are so done. We, you know, everything is making him worse. And the nurse... 
um, helped get the family out of the hospital against medical authorization. Yeah, yeah, that was, I mean, that was, I was so mad. I'm telling you, that, it's an emotional movie. I was mad, I was sad, I was, it was great. I know. And it's interesting that you're a doctor. A lot of doctors get pissed off by that movie because it makes them look really bad, but this is what actually happened. Yeah, no, I was mad at the dang doctors in the movie, right? Because that's, that's the way it went down. That's the way it went down. So it turned out well. They got him to Hopkins. They put him on the diet. He turned around right away. So it was another success case. And that young man is now, I want to say, in his early 40s. And I've met him. Jim has kept in contact with him. And he's gone on to leave a perfectly healthy life. I believe he's married now. He spoke at one of our, wow. our fundraisers. Um, so Jim, uh, again, this movie is now 25 years old. Jim, um, at the time, was a neighbor of Meryl Streep's. Her kids went to school together in Santa yeah, Monica. Yeah, she starred she as the woman. Who was the dad or the grandfather? I don't know. Was the it Leon? Was it Leon um, uh, what's his name? He plays in the action movies. Leon? 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 Anyway, no, fantastic. Yeah, you, I you, don't, I'm not a... Very much a movie. Person. Yeah, I, but you have to watch the movie, folks. I'm telling you, it's worth watching. I've seen it twice in each time. Matter of fact, I played clips of the movie in some of my seminars. That's how dramatic it is, and it's, it's a real story, obviously. Well, Jim will love to hear that um, yeah. because he's, you know, he's been criticized. So he not only wrote, he directed, and he produced that movie. And that movie to this day is still how people find out about the diet. He gets, you know, communications regularly that this is how people found out about the diet. My aunt saw this movie. She suggested it to. That's amazing. And, and he got you into this. So, I mean. Oh, yeah. So huh. he went on Dateline, exposes what happened to his kid. Our neurology department at our children's hospital gets bombarded with phone calls. The neurologist comes to my department, gets me involved. So then Jim and I met, meet, and Jim is from this area. He's from Milwaukee, where I now live. So he has family here. And so we started to communicate regularly in person and on the phone. And finally, I talked him into hiring me because <laughs> I said, I can help you. I, you know, I know what the problem is. The problem is that there's not enough people like me trained to yeah. get people on this diet. So let me help you do that. And after a couple of years of me telling him that, he finally, you know, I, he, was, he was like, I think, very reticent about getting involved with the healthcare community because they're the reason Charlie didn't get to the diet in time. Jim found out about it on his own yes. medical library at UCLA. So anyways, um, so we've been together now since 2005, working together, uh, doing a lot of different advocacy, educating professionals, putting together meetings. I travel all over the world and train mostly pediatric hospitals how to do this, but now I'm getting more involved in adults because now the evidence is out there that it helps adults with epilepsy and that it helps with mood disorder. And, um, and as you mentioned before, Alzheimer's, I mean, the, the brain is this fantastic organ that we are just learning so much about. And lo and behold, diet has a huge impact on your everyday thinking. Um, and fasting, which you are an expert in, um, is, has these same benefits. In fact, the ketogenic diet mimics fasting. That's how it came about. Yes. And so, you know, it's, it's just amazing to me how people, A, don't know about it, and B, are reluctant to try it, despite all these fantastic benefits that it has. Yeah. So uh, what really drew me in is just starting to work with people on this diet and seeing the change, like overnight. And yeah. again, I was working with children initially, but to see them go from being kind of groggy and dopey on their medicines because they have epilepsy and the medicines usually are in high doses when they're not under good control. So going from that state and then 24 hours later being bright and alert and paying attention and answering questions, it was, to me, it was just like unbelievable. Let, let, let's start there. First of all, I'm, I'm going to now label you as the queen of ketosis because <laughs> I mean, you know, you outdate, you know, anyone I've had on this show, okay? I mean, in a good way with ketosis. Oh, it has me. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, but what you started to, for me is what really ignited ketosis back in this country. You know, ketosis was really pop popular, you know, the turn of the century in the early 1900s, right? I mean, there was like, there was a fire. Then all the, the drugs started coming out 
for neurodegenerative conditions, and then it lost its vogue, if you will. <laughs> and I think that movie is what made it back in vogue, you know? I mean, honestly, so you're the queen. All right, Queen Beth. So let's start here. Um, based on what you just said, why does it, why does it work? I mean, what, you know, how does it do this to the brain? Tell our viewers about that, because I do still get that question all the time. So I, I guess you first have to say, uh, for what condition are you talking about? Because there's different mechanisms, right? Well, let's talk about the brain. Uh, yeah, I mean, because we, cause we kind of started there with epilepsy. Uh, obviously, we even mentioned uh, Alzheimer's. Well, what Hippocrates knew in 460 BC was that fasting was good for the brain. I mean, he's the father of all doctors. He knew this, and he used it for treating many different conditions. Why that didn't catch on, I, um, Jim Abrams always comes back to, if it doesn't make money, it doesn't become popular, right? That's, right. that's true for fasting, and that's true for the ketogenic diet. Yeah, yeah. Both in that same realm. But um, this cognitive clearing that I witnessed so many times with everybody that I worked with within 24 hours, and children go into ketosis very fast, so everything is quicker than when working with adults. I have to remind myself to be patient with adults because they're, they're not as compliant and they, their metabolism moves slower. But in children, I would see these immediate results. Their brain would just respond beautifully to either fasting or just starting them on the diet. And over the years, we've stopped the fasting to get them on the diet quicker because they go into ketosis so rapidly, like within 24 hours of just- I was gonna say that kids can get in in a day or two. Adults right. typically take two to four weeks. Right. And, and some people struggle even beyond that because they're metabolically broken. They're not, that's another story, but you're right, kids immediate. Yeah, and there's always, you know, there's always a parent to make sure they get the food, whereas an adult, you know, they're often on their own. So, um, just think of what is going on here that they have this sort of miraculous turnaround in 24 hours. Well, it's all about the brain's energy source, and every textbook, every health textbook that you and I know says glucose is the preferred fuel source for the brain, right? Well, we know that's not true. That's right, because they're only comparing it to fat, meaning the brain can't use fat. However, fat breaks down in ketones, and the brain loves them. They, it loves ketones, and it performs better with ketones. Most people perform. I've never met anybody that hasn't performed well with ketones, except for a few people that have very rare metabolic disorders, and those have been identified, and they're just, like I said, they're very rare something that we screen kids for um, before we put them on the diet. But it, it is quite amazing to see the transition. And um, today is my fasting day. I can even just tell the difference in my brain clarity and my energy level um, from today versus yesterday. Um, I, it's just, I just know. It's, uh, it's 2.38 my time. I still haven't eaten a bite of food. <laughs> I've exercised in the morning. Um, I went on a bike ride actually for an hour, pretty intense. How did I do that? I had no food. Well, I'm fat adapted. I'm in ketosis. Actually, for fun, my ketone levels were 1.8 this morning. Okay. Because I had a glass of wine and a half last night, so I just wanted to see how my body had reacted to that. <laughs> uh, yeah. Do you also check your glucose? I always do, yeah, actually. So, um, especially because I have clients we check glucose and ketones in the morning and then we do it before before first meal glucose should drop ketones should go up because if glucose is high you're not really getting the benefit of the ketones you know all that yeah it's like a seesaw effect that's mm -hmm. the way i try to explain it to people it's yeah. not until your glucose is below 100 are you going to start to see ketones um and and Fasting is great at getting glucose down, at drawing down the glucose reserves called glycogen in the liver. You got to draw that down before the body's going to say, all right, I'm done with that source. I, I'm going to use the fat that's over here in your belly or the fat that you just gave me in your diet. So the body has, is very uh, efficient at switching back and forth between these different energy sources. And, and actually, to your point, and you, you and I both know Thomas Seyfried well, um, he would say, you know, you have to get the glucose down to get the benefit of the ketones. And a lot of people, the only way to get the glucose down 
um, is through restriction, meaning not eating like we're saying, you know, during the day, um, you know, or doing times, short times of restricted calories even. Um, you know, we're not for caloric restriction long term, but restriction like we're talking about, it works to get the glucose down. Exactly. It, it, they have to do that. And, and most people, I, I read 80 to 90% of people um, that are, are obese have uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And part of that is just way too much glucose in their liver, right? Yeah. So right there. Yeah. All right. So, um, you know, the brain loves ketones, right? I mean, it, ketones burn cleaner than glucose, right? I always like to give the analogy of glucose burns like wood. You need a chimney, right? Mm -hmm. But ketones burn like natural gas on the stove, right? It's one of the reasons why it downregulates inflammation. Uh, you know, there's, there's actually new studies. Uh, the, the, the studies showing the connection between the microbiome and the brain. Well, ketones change the microbiome. So people are trying to fix their gut with probiotics doesn't work see what ketones do so yeah. good, good good point so what other what are some of the, the best applications if you will for ketosis well the the primary one that it was designed for um, is epilepsy but uh tom will tell you yeah but it was also at the same time in germany it was um recognized helpful for for cancer yes those two kind of uh, came about at the same time. The doctors did not know each other. But um, a doctor at the Mayo Clinic noticed that his patients who were fasting for procedures were reporting fewer seizures. And he said, this, there's something to this. So he started to fast his patients with epilepsy. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, most of them had far fewer seizures. So then he designed the ketogenic diet to mimic it. So fasting, again, is that's the primary um, uh, condition for which the diet has been used for a long time. And as you alluded to before, um, it was actually used quite a bit in the 1920s. But after World War II, a whole bunch of anti-seizure medications were released, right? And everybody put the diet away and said, man, it's easier to use drugs. You just take them twice a day. But the fact of the matter is 30 percent of people with epilepsy have seizures that the drugs do not help at all. So um, it, it, new drugs come out every couple of years, and that statistic remains the same. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the primary one. Cancer, I think, would be probably the second mm -hmm. uh, to that. In that and, and by the way, folks, um, Tom, we mentioned uh, Dr. Tom uh, Seyfried. Uh, Brilliant guy doing a lot of studies with ketosis, fasting, and, and uh, cancer. Wrote a book, Cancer as a Metabolic Disease. Get it? Um, I've done two interviews with him here, so um, Ashley can put up those show notes. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Take I didn't want to stumble upon that. We would lose it because the, the people that have cancer are like, where do I find more information on that? <laughs> right, right. Yeah, you need to look at some of Tom's work. It, most of it floats over me, but I've watched it enough to know <laughs> the basics. Um, and that is, um, it's much, much more than just glucose being a fuel for tumor, which is the easy, you know, that's the, that's the reader, Reader's Digest explanation that right. understand tumors grow on glucose, but it's actually yeah. far more than that. There's an anti-inflammatory effect and um, all kinds of signal, signaling. And, and Tom's work has actually evolved since I met him many years ago. And, um, and so now he actually recommends periods of intense carbohydrate restriction, ketogenic with, um, and then fasting and then going back to higher carb. And, and so not being on the same exact macro intake um, that we typically use for epilepsy. And by the way, Beth, I was in a mastermind with Tom and Mercola and, and Ron Rosedale and some others. And I was talking about how we do this feast famine thing with our, you know, and it forces adaptation. And these other guys were like, like, well, you know, what? Well, yeah. And, you know, Ron Rosedale was asking me questions and, and Tom came out of a skin because he had this, he had developed this thing to push pulse the thing. And he's like, finally, because I'm combating these guys and Tom's like, Papa's right. You know, it's like, let me tell you what we're finding. Right. And then he went off of why the dietary switch, you know, is the, is the key anyways. 
it was it was one of my best days in my life because I got validated by Tom. So <laughs> it was like I didn't have to defend myself anymore after that. Anyways, funny story. Go ahead, Finn. Yeah, I, it, it, it's just amazing the science that uh, he has done and, and the evolution of it. Um, but the reason he's he has moved toward this this press pulse is because. Um, in animal studies anyways, some tumors can adapt to ketones and start growing on ketones. So that's, that was the reason for this shift. So uh, listeners should know, you know, this is all um, in the early stages and, and more to come because this is a high area of interest. And there's several researchers in the country taking a different look at this from different angles. Um, and, uh, and they all, what I love about it is that they communicate with each other. They're not in competition, they communicate. So I get to be part of that group. I get to see them at our big meetings, at our big global ketogenic symposiums. So, um, so where were we going now with- Well, yeah, we were just talking about the applications for it. I mean, I, you know, seizures was where it started, right? And then, you know, like you said, cancer technically started in the early 1900s as well. I mean, Otto Warburg, you know, I mean, a lot of that work that, you know, Tom has really expanded upon. Um, yeah, what about neurodegenerative you know, conditions? Because, you know, I see absolutely stunning results with that myself. I mean, from autism to Alzheimer's. So my uh, experience with neurodegenerative disorders has largely been with the autism community, yeah. and mostly with children. And again, Sometimes we see these phenomenal overnight changes, and sometimes it takes weeks. And I always tell people, like, give it weeks. Don't be frustrated because things could get worse before they get better. I mean, when you're putting a child with autism who only eats five foods to begin with, and most of them are high carb, and changing that diet completely, some of the struggle is just coming up with things that they'll like. Um, not giving into the behavior tantrums or whatever, so it's it's an adjustment. Yeah. Um, and I tended to, because I'm uh, remotely and I work with people from around the world. I'm not in a clinic anymore, or a hospital setting. I have to be also very cautious. So I tend to do, do a startup very gradual with kids, especially kids that I feel are finicky eaters. Almost every kid I work with is. Um, so I do it really gradually. I start them up like just work on one meal a day that's keto, keep the other two the same. And then we do that for a week. And then next week, we're going to go to two meals. And then maybe go to three. I've had some parents that actually just do two meals and I have them weighing out these foods so that they're getting the correct macros because they, it's not an intuitive diet. High fat is not intuitive. When I say mm -hmm. high fat to people, they think like, okay, you want me to fry my foods? You want me to, you know, saute everything? Yeah. Actually, no, it's the opposite. No, exactly. So let, let's get let's give our let's give our listeners and viewers some details there. So tell us um, because I know that's what they want, right? I mean, even the people who've watched and know about ketosis, they still want to hear it. So um, let's talk about one of those meals, right? And if we talk about the kids, then that will apply to adults, right? Because if we can get the kids to eat it, surely you can do it too. So let's talk about the like this one meal. What what do you have them do? And let's look at it yeah. closer. Well, I, kids are definitely different animals, and they're so much more adventurous than adults. Yeah. You know, adults have these old habits, and they want to find something that matches what they used to eat. They want something like bread that looks like bread that tastes like bread. And, you know, and so you're jumping through hoops trying to make them happy. Whereas kids, they get hungry, they'll eat whatever you give them. And, and so that's what I miss about children is that they're, they're really easy to get onto a ketogenic diet. We don't have these food battles. Um, but typically for kids, we tend to use eggs for a meal in different forms two or three times a week. Like, and first people are like, oh, I thought we weren't supposed to eat eggs. And I, nope, eggs are fine. Cholesterol. Eggs are actually the perfect food in my eyes. <laughs> yes, it's the perfect food. I have, pe I have parents that have gotten chickens because they eat so many eggs. Yeah. And they see pictures of the chicken in their lawn chair in the backyard because they've, um, they're going through so many eggs. They can, it's cheaper to just have your own chicken. But um, so they tend to have eggs like every other day. And then um, another, so we always think about a protein food with a carb food and then fat, usually two different types of fat. So high fat yogurt with say uh, some raspberries, which is fairly low on carb. Mm -hmm. And then maybe mixing in some oil into that yogurt. Um, I use a lot of MCT oil because it's a little bit more ketogenic than its source, which is coconut oil. 
Um, and then maybe another source, um, if the kid's okay with dairy, we might do, we might mix up some heavy whipping cream into the yogurt to make it larger. And oh, that that's makes it really good too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. so that's typical for kids. Um, uh, hemp seeds, I have a lot of people asking for vegetables. By the way, that's a really great tip. So you said that you put the whipping cream in, which I love to do any, grass fed, 100%. There's zero carbs in it. It's basically fat. But when you whip it up, I, I usually put a little stevia and blueberries in there. And that's like kind of like my dessert, but when I'm in ketosis. But so you do that to put it in the yogurt so it's more volume? More volume, right. Okay. And so they feel like they're eating a lot more. Yes, yes. One of the complaints about the diet is the portions are small. And that's true. The portions are small. So I'm always trying to think about volumizing things for people that love the you know, the physical delight of putting things in their mouth. Um, the other tip I give people is that you can whip cream in a blender. You don't have to get out the mixing bowl and the beaters, and that's a big mess. You can do it in a blender, like um, a bullet blender or ninja blender. Even though it has blades, you can whip the cream in, in literally less than a minute, and then it stores very nicely for about a week. So um, once you, you know, once people learn that these little tips to make their life easier, then they're okay, we can do whipped cream. You know, like people don't know whipped cream is something that you make at home. They think it's in a can or in the freezer in a, in a container. It's no, it's yeah. something you make at home. So um, we use cream a lot for children, although- I should... By the way, most, most kids will do cream because that sometimes they can't do the lactose. Well, there's no lactose in cream. <laughs> um, so there's, there's a little- you Can't do milk, can't do milk because yeah. milk has carb. Although um, there, I will do for kids that really like milk or the taste of milk, we can do some of the nut milks, which are like almond milk. Or yeah, almond, unsweetened almond milk, yeah. And, and then, um, you know, you can always mix some heavy cream into it to bump the fat up or a little bit or some, oil into it. So there's a lot of little tricks and, and this is what I do. I write guides, very practical guides. I have one for kids, I've got one for adults, one for blender diet because I have a lot of people with feeding tubes. So I don't want them on a commercial ketogenic formula. I want them eating real food if they can. So do, you have, um, do you have resources for some of your guides that our viewers and watchers, give them your uh, information. Yes, uh, charliefoundation.org. So yeah. I write these guides and then the Charlie Foundation sells them and that's an, a source of income for them. Charlie Foundation is a great resource for keto. So yeah, thank you. So, and, and they primarily were for epilepsy for many years and then in 2012, they just said, open the door to all comers because we know this, this diet can help everyone. So we've expanded beyond epilepsy and we talk about other conditions. Um, pretty heavy on recipes because that's what people go to our site for. We notice that that's, that's the highest used area of the, the website is the recipes. So we've done a lot of uh, special recipes and are, uh, you know, into the, you know, gluten-free and a lot of people are doing vegetarians. We try to highlight those to give people variety. Um, people tend to get stuck on a ketogenic diet eating the same thing every day. True. I was going to mention, um, kind of speaking to that, um, porridge made with hemp hearts, um, which are nearly carbohydrate free, very high protein. It's vegan. They're high in omega threes. I mean, there's nothing bad about them. They have fiber. Well, actually, they have a perfect ratio, a four to one ratio of omega three and six. You need the six too. Everyone talks about the three, but the six is the key to the membrane. So it's perfectly in balance. Yeah, that's a great. So what's this recipe? I, I get porridge. What, what do you do? It's simply you, it, use the hemp just like you would oatmeal. And you can heat it up with milk or just water. I use water myself. Lots of butter. You wow. Can throw, you can throw some berries. I put tons of cinnamon, like a half a teaspoon of cinnamon. I love the cinnamon taste on there. Wow. But on a cold winter day, which we have many here in Wisconsin, that is very, you know, a warming meal for me. I, and I don't eat breakfast. I don't eat until usually one o'clock. So I'll have that as my first meal of the day. Um, but I've put pecans in it, um, just like you would for oatmeal. You just think about... Yeah, exactly. So, and you just boil it in water, same way as oatmeal. Yeah, I don't even boil it. You pretty much are just heating it up because it's not uncooked. It's, but it gets soft and gooey yeah. like oatmeal. Yeah, but very high in protein. So you can get a good 10, 12 grams of protein in a, hmm. in a serving. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so 
Um, so that's another one that, that kind of opens the door for people when they hear, I can have porridge, you know, I don't have to give up my oatmeal. Great idea. I never thought of that. Yeah. You can even add a little flax to it, make it a little gooier if you wanted it. You, know. you can definitely. Yep. Yeah. I would add the flax at the end because it does get gooey. When yeah. You mm -hmm. it into hot water. Right. Yeah. That's brilliant. Okay. Now I'm like, you know, now I want to know more. So, okay. So that. That's, um, you said that people get stuck, right? So um, what are some other things, you know? So I, I guarantee you like half my viewers are like, yeah, that's me, I'm stuck. I'm eating the same four things. <laughs> right, right. I'll, I'll never forget, uh, I went to a wedding recently and I um, checked in at the desk and the guy that checked me in asked me for my email address and my email address has keto in it. And he goes, keto, I did that keto. I did that last summer. All I ate was bacon for two weeks. I felt horrible. And I, you know, and I just thought, no kidding. <laughs> I would, I'd say, okay, that's the Adkins diet, you know, <laughs> not to throw Adkins under the bus. I, you yeah. know, I'm saying he, he did a lot, but that, that would be technically an Adkins diet. Right. But that's, this is what people think about is bacon because it's high fat. It tastes good. You know, it's got protein in it. I rarely eat bacon. That's just not, something that I grew up eating um, it's I, I'll have it at a restaurant but I don't like the greasy mess it makes so I don't have it very often but there's a lot of other options um, besides bacon one of my most favorite options that I share with everybody and especially with kids because kids are not great fish eaters is um, uh, a au gratin recipe that's so simple so um, I have to back up a little bit one of the, one of the uh, ingredients is mayonnaise, but I don't recommend people use mayonnaise from the grocery store. Most of them are made with soybean oil. Right. You can find avocado oil mayonnaise, or you can make your own, which is much cheaper, and it's very simple once you do it, mm -hmm. right? It's basically whipping in oil in a blender with some egg yolk and um, adding a little bit of mustard. So anyways, homemade mayonnaise, and then... The cheese in there and a little bit of lemon juice it's a nice creamy sauce that you put over your fish and if it's a very thin fish you can put it over the fish raw and you just broil it if it's a thicker fillet you should broil your fillet for a few minutes and then put the topping on and then finish broiling it and it's nice and brown and um, I like making it in a little individual uh, pan so that it becomes that person's you know full pretty much their full meal um, they'll have like broccoli or asparagus on the side, but it is a delicious way to eat fish, very rich in fat. Um, and you, you lick up every last bit of the fat because it's so good. So that's another one I like to share. That's also on the Charlie Foundation website in the recipe section. Yeah, yeah that's great. What did, what did you call it? Uh, fish au gratin. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I just, eat, you know, I put that on everything actually. So, I mean, avocado, I'd put that on in my avocado. I mean, I, I, I like putting things on avocados, right? Like olive oil, mustard. I mean, you know, just things go on avocados. So, yes, uh, another, even, perfect, another perfect food for the ketogenic diet, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Magnesium and fiber and omega 3 and fat, of course, and uh, vitamin E. And it's just, I mean, it is such, it's a superfood. It's like eggs. Yeah. It's nothing, yeah. nothing can compare. So, I mean, just for new people, I mean, give, give the basics then. I mean, you know, people are like, okay, wait. I mean, tell someone how to get into ketosis. And for some people that's review, but you know, it, it's, I think it's still worth saying. Yeah, I, I would first say, don't do this on your own because despite all the amazing effects that I, we're talking about here, I've run into a lot of people or people have come to me who get into trouble. And it's because they just don't realize that you know, you, this is not, this is more than just changing your food. This is a metabolic change that your body's yeah. going under. And if, and these are people that aren't super healthy. They're yeah, all, get, get a coach. Oh, yeah. They're compromised. But I also encourage people to get some blood work done too, because that's a good way to catch things before they get worse. Like uh, I've, I had someone recently who um, felt horrible in ketosis and um fortunately we had her blood work done in advance and her electrolytes were low you know here it is in summer she's out exercising she doesn't increase her salt intake and 
puts herself on a ketogenic diet. So she was dehydrated and her electrolytes were really low. And that's a very preventable. Yeah. And it's, it's a classic mistake because when you're in ketosis, you dump out glycogen, stored sugar, and you lose electrolytes. And just a teaspoon or two of uh, sea salt it fixes it. Right, right. And who would think of that on their own? I mean, people are like, you're kidding? I have to have salt? I have to put salt in my food? Yeah, lots of salt, like a teaspoon or two. I, I talked to a gentleman who um, has been in, 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 out of ketosis for years, and um, he, carried, he pulled out of his pocket his salt capsules he puts them in in capsules so he yeah make them, like I, I have many clients who do that because they just don't like salt so right. i encapsulate it exactly and then they just swallow it so that that's a simple thing but i've had some more severe issues that have yeah. required hospitalization so i feel i know it doesn't happen to the majority of people but i think it's just a good idea talk to your doctor if your doctor is not schooled in this you have physicians that you have on your website right that people can go to yeah uh, and the Charlie Foundation has a list of also of ketogenic specialists um, who work with will work with your physician um, but just get some help because it can save you hospitalizations losing work time and you know and feeling crummy and all that um, so there so there's a good way to get into ketosis safely is what I'm trying yeah. to get if you get some help rather than struggling through this and i see people struggle through it and then they give up and they don't go back they're afraid they just don't want to go back you know they just mark it off their list so uh, i don't want that to happen to people i want them to get into ketosis safely and get to the point where they're really enjoying it and they don't want to go back yeah to what doing. and there's there's something known as the keto flu you know talk, talk about the keto flu because it makes people feel bad. It typically happens the first three days, right? And, and by the way, electrolytes, we already mentioned one, that can actually cause a keto flu, um, but there's other, other reasons for it. Yeah, your body's detoxing and you go through this detoxification process, that can make you feel crummy. Because we, by the way, because we hold toxins in fat, visceral fat, and when you go into ketosis, you start burning that fat, out comes the toxins. Yeah. So, so if you can think of that, and I, and if people are warned about this, you're going to go through this, think of it as a good thing. You know, when you are going through this horrible crisis, I am getting better because <laughs> my body is releasing toxins. Try to be very positive about it instead of calling everybody and complaining or just laying in bed. I mean, get out, walk, breathe, breathe fresh air, drink fluids, get your salt, talk to people. Um, and you'll get through it and you'll, you'll feel better. So um, hydration, electrolytes, you're releasing toxins. Um, good fats are important because bad fats can make you feel horrible. Mm -hmm. So I, I like to talk to people about, yeah, there's, there's a big difference between good fats and bad fats. Well, yeah, but there's confusion there because we talked about a lot of foods that have very high saturated fat and cholesterol. Most people listening would go, well, aren't those the two bad fats? And we're saying, hey, we love those fats. So explain bad fats to people. Right. So I, I will first explain that the U, our U.S. Department of Agriculture proclaimed in 2015 that saturated fat alone does not cause cardiovascular disease. After much debate, and Gary Tobbs was kind of at the top of this effort to um, unvilify fat and so I always think of him when I think about that Time Magazine curl of butter saying, you know, fat has been exonerated from all of these myths. So saturated fat is good. Um, Jeff Folick says that about half of our body fat is saturated and the other half is monounsaturated. So he feels that, you know, your diet should kind of mimic that. You should look for both sources. So let's talk about saturated fat sources. I mean, we already talked about um, eggs, uh, butter. Butter is about 60% sat fat. Um, and I'll go a little further with the butter. I like buying European butter or cultured butter because of the vitamin K2 level, if it's grass fed and they, and they add cultures to it, the vitamin K2 level is really high and that's an anti-inflammatory, it's good for your bones. So that's, that's a unique type of butter to look for. Coconut oil, 
you know, to this day, the American Heart Association is still telling people that coconut oil is bad for you. There was just an article out last week, coconut oil is bad for you. I'm sure you got emails. Yep, I did. I did. Yep. And so why they aren't looking at the new evidence, I don't know. I, I have suspected because they're being supported by yes. industry um, that doesn't support coconut oil. <laughs> that, that's, that's what it is. It, it's who's supporting that, yeah. Yeah, and that's, that's horrible because it's just a crime, which we won't get into. So coconut oil, and then we have the derivative of coconut oil, which is MCT oil, which is a little more powerful. And, and I tend to use that with my really sick folks who don't are expending a lot of energy because it just gets their ketones a little better. Um, so those are, those are the saturated fats. And then of course, visible fat in meats. Um, again, we, we, you mentioned grass fed. So you, fat is where toxins harbor. And that's why we prefer if you're going to eat the fat on any beef, pork, veal, whatever, you should have uh, the animal that has not had hormones and, yes. and other pesticides or whatever added to it. So those fats are also good. Um, and now you can buy um, lard and duck fat and other fats in a jar um, if, if you're not getting them in the lean meats that you're purchasing. So those, those are highly saturated. And then we have our monounsaturates, uh, avocado. Olive oil. Oil, olive oil. So um, I prefer using my avocado oil for sauteing because it, it takes heat. Yeah takes heat better than olive oil. Olive yeah. oil, you can easily overheat and then you'll see the smoke come up and that's not a good thing. Yeah, make good um, fat bad is what I say. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, but what you don't want to have are the canola and other seed oils, safflower oil, right? Um, uh, corn oil. These are highly polyunsaturated and it's been proven that those are inflammatory. So when you go to the grocery store and you look at all the oils, mostly polyunsaturated oils populate the shelves. Well, when you go into Whole Foods, canola oils and just about everything, it's bad. It, it, you know, these, these polyunsaturated fats get in the cell membranes and disrupt them for 130 days to, of dysfunction is what I like to call it. You know, I, I think uh, the other, that's why I'm not a fan of fish oil because it's polyunsaturated. It's actually even more, uh, it's more fragile than even these vegetable oils that we're discussing. Um, you know, I prefer getting that in fish. That's, that's my opinion. And I've done some shows on that. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm not a fan. I'm not even a fan of just too much DHA. Uh, I think it's overblown, especially now that we've looked at new testing, but I've done shows folks on the dangers of fish oil. Watch them anyway. Yeah. So those are, I mean, the, we, there you go. Those are the bad fats, the vegetable oils the things we talked about the good fats. Um, so all right. I mean, that's, uh, these are really good things. I, this is a question though I have because, you know, the, the key to ketosis, we're talking a lot about fats, but really the key is, is dropping the carbohydrates. Um, you know, there lies the magic of why your body would start to switch over to be a fat burner. So talk about that. You know, what level of carbohydrates do you have to drop to to actually create the ketosis? Yeah. So that's pretty individual. I've had people have yeah. ketones with 50 grams of carb which is amazing. Um, and ketosis tends to be really strong when you go low carb. You tend to get very strong ketosis in the first weeks and then it kind of tapers down. So people might start off saying, yay, I can do 50 grams of carb. And then in three months, they might need to come down um, and then maybe go up again. So again, I, you gotta think about ketogenic restrictions in, in terms of diet tend to be temporary depending on what you're treating. For example, I worked with somebody recently with migraines, and she's been on every known medication. She's been on some of the anti-seizure medications. She's been hospitalized for dehydration and vomiting because of her migraines. And she contacted me about doing keto, and I gave her guidance um, and didn't hear from her for a while. And she came back to me, and she said, I'm so busy sharing you know, my new life with people that I didn't get back to you. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, amazing turnaround but she's also so she was pretty restrictive i got her down to about 20 grams of carb but she said she can vacillate up to 30 or 50 and not have a headache come on um, mm. she's just learned to watch for the you know the symptoms of a headache coming on making sure she's well hydrated and getting her magnesium and those kinds of things so it's variable 
And then it's also, I think, maybe age dependent. Like I could eat a lot more carbohydrate in my earlier years as I'm aging. I'm getting closer to 60. I can't. And we know that um, you become more insulin resistant as you age. So that kind of goes along with it. Um, so I, I have become more diligent about checking my glucose first thing in the morning, um, especially if I have a glass of wine, wine like you did the night before. That's why I checked. <laughs> yeah, that tends to be that tends. To and be actually, my, my glucose actually trended up. I, I I think I was like 92. I mean, and I'm in ketosis, so I mean, normally I'm like way lower than that, you know. So it can be high 70s, low 80s, but you know, I I definitely saw the glucose shift. <laughs> Yeah, and it's it's really instant feedback to do that and say, wow, I got to pull back here. Um, I, I was also going to mention even time of day, like you become less insulin sensitive as the day goes on. So that's why you should not eat three hours before you go to bedtime, mm -hmm. go to bed, right? So individual variations, especially age and then time of day all affect your... Yeah. And, and all your right, last question. What about our vegetarians? Can I do ketosis? Uh, so I work mostly with vegetarians that allow dairy and fish, and it's easy. It's actually yeah, it is easy because again, it's carbohydrates, right? I mean, so and there's plenty of other fats to help with the calorie yeah. difference. And then and you get plenty of protein from you know uh, dairy, fish, mm -hmm. poultry if they're doing poultry. I do have a woman that I'm working with. Um, on a vegan diet, but she has a tube feeding. So she only, she, her diet is actually very limited. So she's not tasting it, it's going through a feeding tube and she's doing very well. I have her, you know, on gobs of supplements to make up for what she's not getting um, because it is limited in types of foods. Right. So it's possible, it's just, vegan is very difficult. I, and I don't, I, I encourage people like- if you're really we, We've had, I, you know, I'm not a fan of vegan, but I mean, well, short period. I, I'm fine with it for short periods, but um, you know, we I've had people successfully do ketosis, you know, with a vegan diet, actually one of my doctors that I trained. So it's possible, not easy, well, but it's I, possible. But right, people will do it. If they, if they have a goal in mind or a condition that they want to change, they'll make it work. Yeah, absolutely. Well, the queen of ketosis, you're going to have to change your, some of that and just, just start calling yourself the queen of ketosis. That's what I'm going to refer to you as. So Beth, uh, thank, thanks for being here. Gosh, you know, what a wealth of knowledge in this uh, area. Hey, get the movie. You know, I'm telling you, first do no harm. Great movie. Go to the Charlie Foundation. I mean, you know, great stuff. Wow. You know, I didn't know that you were, you know, the one putting all that information out there. You're the queen. Yeah. And well, thank you. That's so sweet. And if I may add, if you want to contact Jim Abrams, go to the contact us link on charliefoundation.org. He's the one that receives all of those posts and he will respond to you. Do me a favor. Let's get him on the show. Well, he'll happily do that. He's he's a great uh, interviewee. So yeah, we reach hundreds of thousands. We got we got to get him out there. I mean, he needs he needs recognition just because of who he is. I'm I'm so impressed. All right, hey Beth, thank you for being on the show. Really, it was it was great. You know, such great information. Thank you very much. Well, that's it for this week. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. And practitioners, you are invited to join us at Dr. Pompa's Live It to Lead It seminar in Las Vegas from November 2nd to the 4th. You can go to hcfevents.com for more information. And you can use the promo code CHTV to take $200 off the ticket price. We would love to see you there. We'll be back next week and every Friday at 10 a.m. Eastern. We are deeply grateful for your support. Please remember to spread the love by liking, subscribing, giving an iTunes review, and sharing the show with anyone you think may benefit from the information heard here. And as always, thanks for listening.